Hello everyone. Uh, let me extend a very warm welcome on behalf of the Unique Academy. We are going to discuss today, as far as this session is concerned, how to prepare for civil services examinations. And for sake of convenience, I am going to divide this session into a brief session into two parts. The first part will deal with civil services and obviously the civil services examination. And the second part, importantly, will deal with how to prepare, how to commence one's own preparation for civil services examination. For sake of convenience, I am going to take help of a sort of PPT which contains five questions as part of the first part and another set of five questions as part and parcel of the second part that is how to commence one's own preparation. So let me welcome all of you once again on behalf of the Unique Academy and let us get started with today's topic. As you can see on the screen, the first part is titled as knowing civil services as well as obviously civil services examination which is simply split into five questions and let us read it out. What is civil service? And I am going to be very, very brief while answering each and every question. The second question is what is the role? In other words, what does civil service do? Exactly do. The third, what is the way in which the members of the civil service are selected? So what is the method, what is the mode of selection of the civil services? And today I am just going to focus on one very prominent way of selection of the civil services or civil service. Fourth, what is UPSC? Uh, and yes, uh, whenever we do talk of the civil services, we have to inevitably refer to a constitutional commission, constitutional body named as or known as Union Public Service Commission, short form is UPSC. And the last question as far as the first part is concerned is what are the basic qualifications which are required in order to appear for the civil services examination. As far as the second part is concerned, how to commence one's own preparation. So we'll be elaborately dealing with each and every aspect of the process of preparation. And again, what I have done even in the second part is to split the various aspects in the form of five more questions. Let us read it out and then get back to the first part, discussion of the first part. When should one begin preparation for this examination? Second, how should one commence, initiate one's own preparation? Third, what kind of planning is needed for civil services examination? That is in order to prepare for the civil services examination. The fourth, what kind of academic abilities? And I think uh, this is a critical question which is quite often confronted by beginners and even their parents. So obviously we are going to elaborately deal with the academic abilities which are required, which are essential as far as preparing for civil services examination is concerned. And the last, what kind of extracurricular? Now here we are going to discuss extracurricular to mean non-academic abilities. Okay, and I'll elaborate upon this last aspect of preparation for civil services examination. Now let us get started with the very first one. What is civil service? Civil service is a government service. It is also known as a public service. Civil service as part of a broader machinery called as Indian administration or Indian public bureaucracy happens to be an integral part of one of the important organization of our government or governmental machinery that is the executive. Now this civil service which looks after the civic affairs or the responsibilities concerning our society contains almost 18 to 22, sometimes 23, 24 civil services such as Indian Administrative Service, the short form is IAS, Indian Police Service, IPS, Indian Foreign Service, okay, IFS, Indian Revenue Service, which in turn is divided into two parts. One is the income tax, that is IRS income tax, and the other happens to be IRS customs and excise. So thus, we have 18 to 24 civil services, that is the posts, the positions, which are part and parcel of 
the term civil service or the gamut of civil services. Now, number two, what is the role of the civil services? Now, this question can be answered by just using one word or through one word that is implementation. So, the core function, the core responsibility of civil services as part of Indian administration happens to be implementation of laws enacted by Indian parliament and policies framed by the government of India. Okay, so implementation. However, for sake of convenience, we can take note of the task of implementation, the responsibility of implementation by splitting it into its four important facets. Okay, now the first facet happens to be of the function of implementation, the revenue functions. That is the functions which are concerned with the task of revenue collection. Okay, so one is the land review obviously and the other important source in modern day administration happens to be the income tax, the customs and excise, so on and so forth. So, revenue happens to be one important facet of the core role of the civil services. The second important aspect happens to be law and order. Okay, and I think uh, IPS is quite well known for that. That is one service from the gamut of civil services which is given the task of looking after the law and order. The third aspect of the task or responsibility of civil services happens to be certain quasi-judicial functions. Okay, sometimes certain disputes are brought to the office of the civil servant, the concerned civil servant may be at the level of the block, may be at the level of the district and the concerned civil authority in the form of administrative officer is supposed to settle down the dispute, okay, give his her decision in the form of the authority. So, certain functions are known as quasi-judicial functions and that happens to be the third aspect of the function dash role and responsibility of the civil service. And then comes the fourth one which is very very important and quite well known and I think this fourth facet happens to be that facet which keeps on attracting youngsters towards the civil services and that fourth aspect happens to be the developmental function. Okay, so thus what is the role of the civil services? In one word, it is implementation. But in turn, we can understand the function of implementation, the task of implementation in the form of four facets respectively, the revenue, the law and order, the quasi-judicial function, and last but not the least, the developmental function, the developmental role and responsibility. Now, let us slip into the third question. How are the members of this service selected? What is the mode of selection? There are two mega modes, let us say, or prominent ways of selecting civil services or members of the civil services. So, one is writing an examination, which is also known as a competitive examination, uh, civil services examination. So, one mode is to appear for the competitive examination known as civil services examination, uh, which is conducted by the UPSC, that is the constitutional body, which is provided right in the constitution of India, right from day one itself. But there is another mode of selecting the members of the civil service, but that mode is not that prominent, which is known as the lateral entry method of selecting members of the civil services. But today, we are going to essentially focus on the first mode, and what is that? Writing civil services examination, which is conducted by the UPSC, the commission UPSC. Now, the fourth one, what is UPSC? This question can be answered in two ways. One, so one answer to this question is, UPSC is nothing but a constitutional body, which is known as Union Public Service Commission. So, it is name of a constitutional commission. But on the other hand, in daily language, usual language, usual conversation, the word UPSC, the term UPSC is also quite often used to describe, to get to know an examination, to describe an examination, UPSC examination. So, on one hand, it is used to describe an examination, but on the other hand, to be, to be appropriate, more appropriate, it is essentially name of a constitutional body, 
known as Union Public Service Commission. Okay, now the last question as far as the part A is concerned. What are the basic qualifications which are required? And I'm just going to focus on two. Educational qualification, a candidate who wants to write this examination, appear for this examination, has to have graduate degree from any stream, okay, by any college. However, the university has to be recognized by the UGC. So that is the minimum educational qualification. The candidate has to be a graduate, okay. Uh, however, just one small clarification, even if you are not already a graduate, you can appear for this examination in your last year of graduation. So that is one just technical small detail. And then there is another important aspect of the qualification in terms of age. Okay, 21 years, that is the minimum age qualification as far as uh, appearing for the civil services examination is concerned. So students, this is how civil services can be understood along with the examination. And we have done this in the form of answering five simple questions. Now let us look at the civil services examination in terms of how to prepare for, how to commence one's own preparation for the civil services examination. But before that, I am going to in brief elaborate upon the scheme of the civil services examination because that is a prerequisite that is essential important task to be undertaken right at this point of time. Now, what is the scheme of the civil services examination? This civil services examination, which happens to be one of the many examinations conducted by UPSC, is made up of three phases. So it is conducted in three phases. So the first phase is known as prelims or preliminary examination, in which we have two papers. The paper first is GS1, General Studies 1 paper, having 200 marks as weightage. And then there is another paper, which is known as CSAT, that is the Civil Services Aptitude Test. Again, this second paper, known as CSAT, enjoys the similar weightage of 200 marks. Taken together, prelims is there for 400 marks. Number one. Number two, of the two papers, GS and CSAT, the CSAT happens to be a qualifying paper, which means a candidate has to secure 33% marks, okay, as far as the CSAT is concerned. And then ultimately, whether you are going to qualify in the prelims, okay, once you qualify in the CSAT, ultimately depends upon rests on the score you are going to secure in the GS paper. Now, what is the nature of the preliminary examination? The preliminary examination, so four words, four key words to get hold of the exact nature of the preliminary examination, which are those four words. One, it is an objective type of examination. The second, based on multiple choice questions. Third, it has got negative marking system and basically prelims as a screening test happens to be a qualifying test. So this is the format of the UPSC civil services preliminary examination. Now, obviously, if the format of the prelims happens to be objective, that of MCQ, having negative marking system and above all a qualifying test, then what kind of preparation is required, needed in order to not only prepare for prelims but get through with flying colors, I think two words are very important through which we can describe the kind of preparation which is required in order to get through the preliminary examination. So you have to be very, very precise and sharp as far as your reading, your revision, your retaining, okay, your solution of MCQs, so on and so forth. So precision and sharpness, this is the requirement as far as preparing for the preliminary examination is concerned. So this is the first phase. Once you get through prelims, that is the first step or stage of the civil services examination, then you get an opportunity to write the mains examination. Now mains is quite wider in its scope because it has four GS papers, GS 1, 2, 3, 4, and each GS paper carries the weightage of 250 marks. So taken together, GS as a component, general studies as a component, has 1000 marks in terms of weightage, which is split into four papers, as I just told you. 
Number two, the second important component of the mains examination is optional subject. Students are given the choice to choose from the list provided by the UPSC one optional subject. And that one optional subject in turn is divided into two papers. For example, if you have history, then history as an optional would be split into history paper one and history paper two. So, so is the case of every other optional offered by the UPSC. So, 500 marks. Then comes the third important component of the mains examination that is essay paper. UPSC has introduced essay paper, an independent essay paper for 250 marks. And in that paper, you have to choose two topics in order to write essay on those what chosen topics or subjects in and around 1000 to 1200 words on each topic. So taken together 1000 for the GS, 500 for the optional and 250 for the essay paper. So if you take it together, then the weightage of the mains examination becomes that of 1750 or 1750. Now, what is the nature of the mains examination? The entire mains examination is written in nature. Aapko likhna hai pe. It is descriptive in format. Okay, you have to describe things, obviously, keeping in mind the, the question asked, okay, the nature of the question, the demand of the question. So, being written in character, being descriptive in character, the requirement of this stage happens to be a twofold requirement. So, one is reading, understanding, comprehending all components which are part of the UPSC means examination. Okay, comprehending every paper, all subjects, each and every bit of the syllabus, there is no doubt about that. Okay, so you will be reading a lot, revising it, processing the material from different sources, making one's own short notes. Then again, revising those short notes. Okay, so that forms part and parcel of this entire process forms part and parcel of. So one aspect of that twofold requirement and that one aspect happens to be understanding and comprehending the syllabus. Okay, all papers, the subjects. But what is the other requirement from the twofold? The other requirement happens to be to be able to write effectively. Because the format of the means happens to be written and descriptive in character. You have to write answers in the means examination. So, on one hand, you have to have understanding, okay, appropriate, apt, okay, understanding of the entire components of the means examination. And on the other hand, you must develop that ability to write effectively, put across things effectively on the paper. And then comes the last phase or stage of the civil services examination, which is generally known as interview. But the commission has used a very interesting term to describe this last phase of interview. And that term is personality test. The weightage is that of 275 marks. And this interview, in a way, and let me be very, very basic as far as explaining the format of the interview is concerned. So it is a kind of oral examination. There is a panel of five members, okay, and then you are being interviewed by the panel member. Now, is there a formally prescribed syllabus for the interview or personality test by the UPSC? The answer is no. But nonetheless, on the basis of our past experience, okay, an observation of the interview which are conducted by UPSC every year, we can nonetheless think of syllabus informally speaking. So the interview dash personality test revolves around sort of cross checking, assessing the understanding of the candidate of his her own personality. Maybe as part of that, your name, name of your parent, your surname, the places you come from, the educational background and the extracurricular activities. So these aspects are very much part and parcel of the personality we are talking of, the candidate who is subsequently to be interviewed by the UPSC. So, this is part of the personal information, sort of a biodata, 
okay, of the candidate. So, being able to understand and comprehend one's own bio data, okay, knowing better about one's own personality, one's own what aspects which I just referred to. The second requirement as far as the personality test is concerned, since you are going to be a civil servant, since you are going to be a government servant, since you are going to be a public servant, you are also supposed to know and have a fundamental understanding of the ecology you are part of. And here ecology means the society, the social aspect, the, the geographical aspect, the economic aspect, the political aspect, importantly, the economic aspect. So, the ecology you are part of, the ecology you come from, and I am using the word ecology in a broader sense of the term. Okay, you should know the basics and the fundamentals of your society. In terms of a brief historical background, geographical features, then the political profile of your society, the place you come from, and then importantly, whatever current issues and problems or challenges faced by the ecology you come from. So, knowing one's own personality on one hand and knowing the society in which you are subsequently going to work or function, okay, discharge your responsibility. These are two fundamental requirements of the personality test. Now, one important ability which is, uh, which becomes besides all these requirements, which becomes very important is the ability to communicate well, very clearly and explicitly, okay. Now, so thus this is the format of the civil services examination. So, prelims which is objective in nature, the mains which is written and descriptive in character and the interview that is the personality test happens to be a sort of oral kind of examination. Now, let us get back to the five questions as part of the part P. Now, when should one begin preparation for this examination? Now, a candidate if aware of the nature of this examination and is deeply interested in making career in civil services, then that candidate can think of immediately starting one's preparation after doing the 12th grade examination. That is right from the very first year of your graduation. If that is not the case, now if there is a candidate gets to know about this examination maybe in the second year or maybe in the third year or maybe in the last year of graduation. Now from that point onwards, the given candidate can well think of initiating one's own preparation. And then the last category of candidates can be or, or will be the graduates. So if a candidate is already a graduate, completed one's own graduation, then he she must be thinking of writing this examination after a year. Now, in coming year, so if you are thinking of writing this examination after one year, then you must start right this moment. So, this is how depending upon your educational background and your knowledge of this civil services examination and I'm, 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 I have in mind the primary knowledge. Okay. So, once you have that primary knowledge, once you cross check one's own interest and confirm your interest and comfort and come to a conclusion that well, I am deeply interested in making career in civil services, then that should be your starting point. Now the second one, how should one, how should one commence one's preparation? Now I am going to answer this question in terms of five small but important steps. The first step as part of commencing one's own preparation happens to be getting to know the nature the format of the civil services. And I think that is what we have been doing. As far as the clarification which I put forward a while ago dealt with this very first step of knowing civil services. Okay, I elaborated upon that a while ago. The second step in the preparation or as part of preparation happens to be to get to know the syllabus of this examination. Now, as far as the preliminary examination is concerned, uh, whether it is the GS from the prelims or the CSAT from the prelims, the commission has given syllabus for both the papers, even though the syllabus given to prelims or given for prelims happens to be a sort of cryptic syllabus, cryptic syllabus, uh, just in five to six heads. Okay. However, 
when we turn to the main syllabus then the commission has provided for the syllabus for mains examination quite in detail okay so history geography uh, society constitution polity then international relations economics science and technology and the gs4 obviously ethics and so is the case of optional paper now the second step which is to be taken up by a candidate a beginner an initiator is this that is reading syllabus very carefully multiple times okay and then understanding the scope of this examination the third step which is critically critically important is to look into the previous year question papers of the upsc civil services examination now if we are talking about the preliminary examination then the present format of prelims was introduced adopted and introduced in the year 2011 so well you can start with 2011 gs and csat paper till 2023 okay so pyqs of upsc civil services preliminary examination then you can turn to the mains examination mains present format the format which which is there as far as the upsc mains is concerned that was adopted in the year 2013 so from 2013 2013 to 2023 you can look into all those previous year question papers so pyqs so the third step as far as commencing one's own preparation is concerned is this that is reading very carefully okay the previous year question papers now this step even if you are a beginner you may not be in a position to make much of the sense even if you read the question paper maybe twice but nonetheless this primary step is very very important of looking into pyqs because a thereby you can get to know as to what are the demands what are the expectations of the commission from you as a candidate number 2 what kind of questions are asked in previous years and what kind of questions are likely to be asked in subsequent coming years okay and ultimately to make it very very simple pyqs that is the previous year question papers helps us helps a candidate to decide the direction of one's own preparation so therefore this is the third important step and i use the word critically important step that is the pyqs sometimes previous year question paper analysis is the term used to describe the third step now moving further fourth step happens to be having reference list at one's own disposal now there are three components of the reference list reference basket so the first happens to be the ncert books and well if you have enough time at your disposal then you can start with fifth grade ncert and uh, to 12th grade ncert geography history economy society constitution polity so on and so forth okay and i am putting it in a very general sense there are certain subjects such as society or economics they may not be part and parcel of the what initial standards okay they may be introduced in the later okay part of the educational system but nonetheless broadly i am uh, what requesting you to start with fifth standard ncert till 12th standard ncert okay but uh, you have to have sufficient time otherwise if you have just one year if you are already a graduate and if you have just one year then you have to be very very selective as far as going through reading okay referring to the first component of the reference list that is selective ncerts only essential ncerts which are required okay number 2 the second component of the reference list happens to be at least one standard reference book for each subject from the gs for example modern indian history bipin chandra's india struggle for independence okay or shekhar bandopadhyay's placid to partition one standard reference book has to be referred to okay in order to prepare for history as part of the gs1 that is the upsc civil services mains examination uh, so this is how the second component of the reference material happens to be 
one standard reference book. I am seeing one, at least one reference book. Okay. Then comes the third component. It is the current magazines and one newspaper, at least one newspaper. Hindu is the prescribed one. But if you think Hindu would be heavy to begin with, then you can well start with Indian Express. And then subsequently, you can shift to Hindu, reading Hindu. Okay, after say maybe two months, three months, so on and so forth. So at least one newspaper, regular reading of one newspaper for the current events and magazine, which generally happens to be roundup of, okay, maybe one month, maybe two months, whatever the, the periodical would be. But magazine, let us say one month. So newspaper on one hand and one magazine on the other hand, critical minimum requirement as far as the current event aspect of the civil services examination is concerned. So this happens to be the fourth step as far as the preparation for or commencing preparation for civil services examination is concerned. I will repeat it once again. The first component is the NCRT textbooks. The second component happens to be one standard reference book and the third one newspaper and maybe one magazine. Okay. The fifth step as far as the preparation is concerned happens to be planning and anyway we have come up with an independent question on that. So let me slip into the next question. What kind of planning is needed? Now the simple straightforward answer to this is an elaborate planning, a detailed planning, a macro plan on one hand and micro planning on the other hand. Now if I have one year okay in order to prepare for the civil services examination and if I am a graduate and going to prepare full time, then how should I divide this slot of 12 months? Now I will discuss few things as a rule of thumb. Okay, of the 12 months, 4 to 5 months can be reserved for the preliminary examination and 7 to 8 months can be utilized in order to prepare for the mains examination. So this is a broad division of a slot of 12 months, number one. Number two. Let us focus on the 7 to 8 month slot to be used for the means examination. Macro, I use the word macro. So, 8 month ka timetable aapke paas hona chahiye. So, on one pole, the 8 months macro plan, but the another pole happens to be the micro. So, 8 months, 4 months, 2 months, 1 month, 15 days, that is a fortnight, 1 week, 1 day. Okay, so a very detailed planning has to be undertaken as a process as part and parcel of planning your preparation is concerned. Okay. And then importantly, you have to plan as far as the mains preparation is concerned. If I am going to utilize the slot of 7 to 8 months, then always I have to keep in mind the three components which are part and parcel of the mains examination. So, four GS papers and in each GS paper, you have maybe two subjects or maybe three subjects. For example, GS1, you have three subjects. One is history, the second is geography, and the third is the society. Now, depending upon the syllabus of the paper, the subject which is part of the paper, again the syllabus of that subject, and importantly, the weightage which is given to the subject. Okay, then the next component happens to be your background, your state as far as the given subject is concerned. If you are a newcomer as far as that subject is concerned, then you are going to require maybe a slightly more time, okay, in order to prepare for that subject. If you are familiar with a the subject, then you may not need that amount of time like other subject. Okay, so this is how all these factors need to be taken note of while making one's own plan. Okay, but you have to have in mind this broader idea that the mains examination is constituted by three components. One mega component happens to be the GS and therefore of the slot of eight months, at least 60% time has to be used in order to prepare for the GS or prepare the GS. Okay, one, two, three, four. The second important component of the mains examination happen to be, happens to be the optional subject. So 500 marks. So, uska syllabus dekhiye, khud ka background dekhiye, the references to be read by you, so on and so forth. So, all these parameters 
the criteria, the factors can be taken note of and then you can come up with a slot to be utilized in order to prepare the optional subject. Okay, but at least I would say 30-35% of time slot has to be used in order to prepare your optional. And then the third component which we should never forget that is the essay paper. It has 250 marks weightage, we know for sure. So, in your plan of 8 months, you have to secure a position for the essay paper. Okay, so this is how if you come up with a detailed plan for the coming 8 months and focus on the mains preparation, then by taking note of all factors which I just referred to and talked about, you can come up with the broad planning, the macro planning as well as the micro planning in order to take on the, the mains examination. Okay, but let me just come up with one small clarification. It is not going to happen that if you come up with a plan, you are going to stick with the plan. The, the planning has to have an element of flexibility. Okay, so depending upon the contingency, depending upon your performance, depending upon your actual preparation, you have to keep on making certain changes in the plan what made by you. Okay, so make a plan, start executing the plan and in the light of okay the execution whether you are able to complete a given task within the uh, what determined time frame or not so the experience is going to play a very critical role uh, in order to make certain adjustments okay or while making certain adjustments as far as your plan is concerned okay so a very detailed plan a meticulous planning and obviously planning process is going to inevitably consist of implementation execution. Okay, the next one, the last two questions which are very important, what kind of academic abilities are required? This is the fourth question and what kind of extracurricular? You can even use the word non-academic. Now, as far as the academic abilities are concerned, like any other examination, one can simply say, that this examination, that is a civil services examination also needs the ability to read and comprehend whatever you are going to read as part of the preparation for this examination. But here, reading something, reading the elements of your syllabus and the write-up on the same, the reading material on the same, you should be in a position to make appropriate, precise, apt sense of the write-up. Okay, so to be able to read between the lines, to be able to understand the implied meaning of whatever you are reading. So, comprehension, understanding that is very, very important as an academic ability. Along with that, critical thinking ability is another academic ability which plays a very critical role. Now, what is mean by critical thinking ability? Now, critical thinking ability, simply speaking, can be defined as a trait which does not allow you to take anything for granted. Okay, then what does it mean? What does it imply? Even if I read something from a source, I am not going to buy the argument as it is. I am going to question it, whether it is so, why is it so, so on and so forth. Okay, only by looking into the particular topic, issue or whatever you are reading as part of the preparation. It is only by cross-checking that, it is only by assessing it that you are going to buy that argument. Okay, take it forward. So, the threat of not taking anything for granted, asking various kinds of questions. Is it so? Why is it so? What are the consequences of being so? So on and so forth. So, this kind of critical thinking ability is going to help you a lot at every stage of the journey. The third academic ability which is required and particularly or especially at the level of the mains is the ability to write effectively. So, comprehension, understanding is no doubt required at the level of mains. Okay, but besides the understanding, good grasp of the subject and the papers, the another important ability 
okay, which is essential at the level of means happens to be effective writing ability. And whenever we talk of effective writing ability or skill, there are at least three aspects of the effective writing ability. So one is obviously the language dimension of the writing ability. So use of proper terms, terminology to be able to make grammatically correct sentence, okay, which is informing meaning categorically very clearly. There is no ambiguity whatsoever. You pay attention to the, the spellings, you make it a point to use punctuation, so on and so forth. Okay, there has to be the flow as far as your argument is concerned. So, but let us keep aside this point, the language aspect. So, terms, terminology, the grammar, okay, then the other things flow and so on and so forth. So, this is first language aspect. The second aspect happens to be the content because without apt content, without pertinent content, without relevant content, we cannot think of effective writing ability. But the content of the writing ultimately depends upon the question. So we have, we we'll have to read the question as, as appropriately as possible, as correctly as possible, and then we'll get to know the exact demand of the question. And then that would determine the content of your writing or content of your answer. Then comes the third aspect of the effective writing ability that is the presentation. Whether you are going to follow a para format or a point format, whether you are going to use uh, techniques such as pie charts, flow charts, okay, and so many other techniques. So this is how mains requires, no doubt, on one hand, good grasp of the subject, okay, over the subject in terms of better understanding and comprehension. But on the other hand, the effective writing ability to put across things, to, to present one's own argument as effectively as possible. So, this is something which is required at the level of the means. Then comes the interview. As I stated earlier, while explaining the scheme of the civil services very briefly, I did refer to one ability that is the ability to communicate with others, which in turn contains the ability to listen carefully to even the others. That is also part and parcel of the effective communication ability or skill. Number two, once you listen to something carefully, you process that immediately, reflect on that, and then by taking a small pause of maybe 10 seconds, you can start responding to the, the question, the query, okay, the whatever question is asked to you by the member of the panel. So this is how the communication skill plays a very important role as far as the personality test is concerned. And besides this ability, whether you are able to take decision, decision making ability is very important, which is assessed in the interview format, the format of the interview. Then whether you are able to deal with contingencies, there are certain situational questions, okay, which are likely to be asked by the panel member. Okay, so the confidence, the transparency, okay, honesty, so on and so forth. These are certain other abilities which play a very significant role as far as the interview is concerned. So, comprehension, understanding and comprehension, dash the critical thinking ability, effective writing skill, communication skill and along with communication skill, self-confidence, transparency, okay, honesty, decision making ability, so on and so forth. So this is a kind of set of abilities which play a significant part as far as the personality test is concerned. Now coming to the last question, what kind of extracurricular non-academic abilities which are required as far as the civil services examination required here, okay, as part and parcel of preparing for the civil services examination. Now it is a common knowledge that this examination tests not only the academic ability of candidates, but even the non-academic abilities. Now, what does it mean? Whether a candidate is able to plan one's own effort, okay? Whether the candidate is able to take decisions at right time and appropriate decisions, okay? Number three, whether the candidate is able to 
ensure consistency in one's own effort whether the candidate is going to ensure the very important fact that whatever you do as part of preparation whether you are in a position to evaluate that so consistency that is maintaining consistency in one's own effort and another thing consistently evaluating uprising one's own efforts it is only through self evaluation consistent continuous and very transparent kind of self evaluation that you can get to know as to what is happening as far as your preparation is concerned okay so these are certain non academic abilities which are required in order to get through this examination so students this is what i wanted to share with all of you with this small session on civil services examination and how to commence one's own preparation for civil services examination i i i stop here thank you